15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello and welcome to the podcast we like to call Space Nuts. I'm Andrew Dunkley and with me as always astronomer at large Fred Watson from the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science. Hello Fred. Hey, how are you doing Andrew? I'm quite well. It's very exciting. There's a lot going on at the moment. Um, <laughs> near miss um, asteroids and there all was, sorts yes, of things. Yeah, right. Had a close yep. call the other day. Last week, uh, yep. But um, they didn't tell us about it till it missed. <laughs> Funny mm. that. <laughs> uh, but today we're going to talk about a few other things. Uh, some new exoplanets have uh, been found and they're pretty close by. In fact, some of the closest they've ever found so far. But what's really interesting about these ones is they may well be able to help us understand planetary formation, maybe. Uh, there's also been, this has only happened in the last couple of days, a solar sail has been deployed. It's in test mode right now, but more exciting news to come on that. Uh, but um, this, is, this is a new um, test on, on propulsion uh, using, um, uh, well, obviously a solar sail gets pushed along um, and doesn't need fuel. Uh, we'll look at that and some questions about UFO detection, antimatter galaxies and uh, Voyager and uh, the New Horizons probe. So uh, we'll get into all of that. Uh, but first of all, Fred, uh, some new exoplanets that have been discovered by uh, TESS. Yeah, TESS, the, um, the planet-finding satellite that in in many ways is a is a successor to the Kepler spacecraft that um, was so successful in finding planets orbiting other stars by the dimming of the light of the star as the planet crossed in front of it. So TESS is an acronym for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, of course. Uh, it's a NASA spacecraft, and it's already doing its thing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, pulling in... Um, uh, d discoveries of new planetary systems. Uh, I think, if I remember rightly, um, one of the distinguishing features of TESS is that it will survey a very, very wide area of sky, uh, unlike uh, Kepler, which looked at re really quite a limited area of sky. So TESS uh, has the, I think it's got the wherewithal to look, look at the whole sky. Uh, and and by doing that, you, you can build up statistics in a perhaps a more uh, sensible way than if you're just looking at one tiny patch of the sky where you, you know you don't have the the benefit of saying well this is this is a global phenomenon so um one of tess's discoveries uh which is called toi 270 and toi stands for tess object of interest oh which is quite yeah. a nice acronym really <laughs> Um, basic but you know functional yeah functional that's right it t tells it like it is um it i mean it's, you know a uh, tob would be a test object of boredom which would yes. be the opposite really <laughs> um, but this isn't a tob it's a toy it's a toy uh, the, and uh, so this is the 270th of these tests objects of interest uh, and um it's already you know got um, scientists excited uh, there is a paper in um, a very recent issue of Nature Astronomy which uh, talks about this system, this system of not just one, but actually three planets that have been discovered with the possibility that this solar system might have more planets as well. So uh, you're quite right, it's relatively nearby, 73 light years away as the crow flies. Uh, but what we are seeing in this system is um, a, a, a rocky planet a bit bigger than the Earth, and two planets which are a bit smaller than Neptune, uh, so that they're called sub-Neptunes, and the other, the bigger than Earth ones, are called super-Earths. Oh, I just, I don't like that. I don't know why, but it really knocks me. It's like when they talk about a super-virus. It just, yeah. oh, it's a virus or I'm, it's not. Yes, I'm, I'm not keen on super as a... As a, a descriptor, mm. yes, super Earth. Anyway, it means it's bigger than Earth. I suppose if it's much bigger than Earth, it's a super duper Earth. Um, but this is only a super Earth. Uh, so it, it's all about what's really interesting is, um, you know, how these planets are formed um, and how 
uh, they come to be in their present uh, sort of circumstances within their respective solar systems. Uh, and the reason why I mentioned that is that these planets, and you and I have spoken about this before, they, they form what's called a resonant chain. A resonant chain is where you've got... Um, how can I put this? Uh, the best, best way to put it is that if you look at the ratio of their orbits, either in the time it takes to go around their parent star or the semi-major axis is the technical term for the distance to the parent star on average. Yeah. Um, if you look at that uh, and look at it for the whole family of planets, then when you look at their ratios, they're in integral numbers. Oh. You know, they, they yeah, actually... yeah, you've mentioned this once before, quite a while ago we talked yes, about something right. like this. Yeah. Probably a couple of years ago because um, uh, I, I don't know whether you remember, but we had um, a TV show called Stargazing Live and one of the things That's we right. did on the show was to put... Uh, to, to, to get citizen scientists to try and discover new solar systems, actually from Kepler data. And one of them, w which was featured, had four planets, which all had this, if, I can't remember whether it was three to five or one to two, but the ratio of each set of planets, uh, the, you know, one planet with its uh, next door neighbour, uh, further in, from, further from its parent star, had the same ratio as that one had with the next one out, mm which had the same ratio as that one had with the next one out. And this is very similar, although the, the resonant numbers are actually slightly different. Uh, for the inner pair, it's a three to five resonance. Uh, for the outer pair, it is a two to one resonance. But still, these resonances occur. Uh, we've got a similar thing in the solar system with Neptune and Pluto. Um, I think it's a two to three resonance there. I can't remember. Uh, but that's telling you that the... The gravitational pull of Neptune has had a significant effect on the on the dwarf planet Pluto and pulled it into this resonance. So um, that's uh, you know something that exists with uh, TOI two seventy, uh, this resonant chain, and it's possible that there might be you know uh, a further one out that would also be in resonance uh, at another inter integral ratio. Um, it means of, as well from time to time. <clears throat> what the what happens to these planets is that they line up perfectly because as the resonances go through, you, you're going to get a situation where they're all in a straight line. Mm. Uh, I, that's not something that it's that that it's it, it's displayed yet, but that that would happen. Um, the the Neptune, sorry, the the, the furthest sub Neptune planet uh, also seems to be in in what you might call the Goldilocks zone of the parent star, uh, the, where liquid water could exist. Uh, but it's thought that there is a very thick atmosphere, and it may even be that it doesn't have a solid surface at all. So it's really only the top of that planet's atmosphere that has the the Goldilocks, um, you know, the, the magic Goldilocks temperature. Um, that's interesting, and, and it also tells you something about the star. So it, that's the furthest out of these planets that's in the Goldilocks zone. When you think of our solar system, it's the you know uh, it's basically the Earth, which is the third planet out that is in the Goldilocks zone. But our sun is a much brighter star than the sun in this uh, little solar system, which is actually something called an M dwarf star. And M dwarfs are cool stars. Um, it's much easier to find a planet around uh, an M dwarf star than it is around a normal star, particularly if you use that Doppler wobble technique where you're looking for the wobble yeah. uh, the planet induces on the star because a lighter star, a less massive star, will wobble more. Um, so people have focused quite a lot on these um, what are called M dwarfs, these cool stars. Uh, the only problem with them is they're known to have uh, very active surfaces with with flares and and you know the kind of storms that we see on the surface of the sun only much more intense. Mm. But this particular one, um, it has been suggested that it is less of a flare star than uh, than many of these dwarf stars because it's an older one. It's kind of quietened down a bit in its old age, uh, and has relatively steady light output rather than something that 
comes and goes in big flashes. Uh, and so that, again, is um, something that, you know, may be conducive to the evolution of life. Who knows? As, as always with these things, we're, we're hypothesizing with very little information. Uh, what we do know with certainty, though, is that these planets are there. Yeah. And the other uh, telling um, sign of a cool star is that wears sunglasses, surfs and plays rock music. <laughs> <laughs> That's an ultra cool star. Yeah, that's a very cool star. Uh, and is it true that uh, this situation, the, the, these planets, because of the, um, the the larger size of the rocky planet, the smaller size of the uh, the other ones, is um, uh, maybe going to give scientists or astronomers a, a potential understanding of planet formation? Is that something they they were hoping to gain from this? Yes, that's right. So um, it, it actually it's the other way around that the the rocky one is the is the smallest of the three. Okay. Um, and and it's it's on the innermost orbit, and and when you think about it, that mimics the solar system. Mm. Uh, but what is odd is that in our solar system we've got the four rocky planets and then the four gas giants, and the boundary between them is something called the the, the snow line. It's where water turns into ice, um, basically. And, and that seems to have been very important in the formation of giant planets. Uh, whereas with these planets, the TOI 270 system, um, the snow line is much further out than any of them. So the gas giants are actually within the snow line, which might be, um, you know, it's an interesting situation for planetary scientists to try and explain how they got like that. Maybe they formed further out and then migrated inwards because that's another possible mechanism for this kind of thing. Well, there have been exoplanets discovered that are gas giants that are quite close to their parent yes, star, that's which, right. which when yeah. first discovered was quite a shock. So, the hot Jupiters. Yeah. yeah, so it turned our sort of thinking upside down, quite literally. So, yes, um, it's, that was it, all the time. Yeah, yeah. well, there's always something new to discover, I suppose. But um, mm -hmm. mm, All right, um, there might be more to learn from, from this uh, new system. Uh, certainly sounds like it's got a lot to offer. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Roger, your lives are here also. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, a lot of people are looking at different ways of uh, delivering payloads and people into space, uh, returnable combustion um, launches and all sorts of things. But right now, as we speak, there is a test going on uh, near the planet uh, where they're using a solar sail. Now, we've talked about solar sails before. This is a fuelless process to push something along in, into, well, across interstellar space, technically. Um, tell us what they're doing. Yes, that's right. So um, it, it is, it's a bit of a hot topic in, in um, you know, the science of astrodynamics, how you, how you send spacecraft around. Uh, the, the idea of a very large sheet of very fine material, something like mylar, uh, which will uh, catch the photons of light that come from a bright source, and in this case it's the sun, which is why we call it a solar sail. Um, and the, the, those photons of light uh, actually, pr uh, what they do is they impart momentum to the, uh, to the solar sail. And because that solar sail is big, uh, it's uh, the momentum that you gain from the sun is significant, and it actually pushes the spacecraft forward or in, in a direction away from the light source. So um, this is... Uh, something that's been an idea that's been around for a long time. It is, just uh, as an aside, it's one of the proposals uh, uh, for uh, that will be tested in a program called Breakthrough Starshot, uh, which is uh, an idea supported by um, the Breakthrough Initiatives Foundation. I think that's what it's called. Uh, in initiated by a Russian billionaire by the name of Yuri Milner. Uh, he's set up a number of uh, initiatives which are called Breakthrough generically. Uh, one of them is Breakthrough Listen that involves uh, kind of SETI type observations with two very large radio telescopes, one of which is here in Australia, the other in the United States. Uh, but Breakthrough uh, Starshot is looking at the potential 
of a laser-driven solar sail flights to the nearest star other than the sun, Proxima Centauri. Mm. Uh, that work is ongoing. Meanwhile, uh, the work that we're talking about today is unfolding, and that's probably the best word for it before our eyes, uh, because the Planetary Society, which is a non-profit organisation, very well-established, long-established uh, uh, society with its mission to explore the planets, um, they crowdfunded uh, a little spacecraft called LightSail 2, uh, which was launched uh, in June, last, about a month ago, uh, June 25th, uh, and then a few days ago, it actually opened its light sail uh, successfully um, and is now kind of sailing. <laughs> I think it's um, basically at the moment, it's uh, drifting uh, in an orbit about 700, a bit more than 700 kilometres above the Earth's surface. And uh, as we speak, what the mission scientists are doing with light sail too is using the solar sail to change its orbit. And that's, you know, the kind of critical test. If you can uh, set up the solar sail in such a way uh, that it's receiving light from the sun in a particular direction and then see the effect of that acceleration uh, on the orbit of the spacecraft, then you, you know that things are working properly and you're kind of on a winner. Um, what's also a winner, I think, is some lovely photographs that were sent back uh, pretty well as soon as... Uh, Light Sail 2 was deployed, showing the spacecraft with the Earth in the background. Very, very nice uh, It is imagery. a spectacular photo. It's, it's like somebody threw away a picnic blanket and they just <laughs> caught it while it was spiralling up through the air. Oh, that's right. <laughs> a very shiny picnic <laughs> a blanket. A very shiny one. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but, but, sorry, go ahead, Andrew. I was just going to ask, uh, how do you steer? Yeah, so you've got to be able to... Uh, essentially, you've got to be able to change the angle of the sail in relation so, to the... So it's not unlike sailing in the wind. Exactly. Exactly the same, uh, with a few subtleties, of course. So you need to um, learn to tack and you lead... And yeah, else I'm not is. sure about tacking, uh, <laughs> sailing to windward uh, or solar windward. Uh, it's really all about, um, you know, the, the it, 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 you think more in terms of the laws of reflection uh, as to how this would work out. Uh, you want the solar sail to be uh, in, a, in a, uh, an angle to the sun, which gives you the acceleration in the direction you want it to be. Because what you really don't want to do is, is inadvertently slow it down rather than speed it up. Yeah. And so, the other thing that came to mind was, how fast can you go? Well, the, the Breakthrough Starshot program, uh, using not solar uh, power, but laser power, They're very high-powered lasers, which are w one of the things that they're actually researching, we, whether you can ever make these things. Mm. So you, you have these things on Earth, and you shoot them, uh, the laser beams, at your solar sail and just blast it along. And you do it uh, for a relatively short length of time, but with a very large amount of energy. So you kind of need your whole a whole city power station to, to provide the power to the laser. But once it's but, going, it's going. Yeah, that's right. But they're talking about speeds... Uh, of about a third of the speed of light. Wow. So you're really? talking about 100,000 kilometres per second. Um, mind you, their spacecraft that they're talking about weigh a fraction of a gram. They're just like a chip with a few electronics on it um, that they hope will be being the signals back. This is all still very much uh, in the world of speculation, but it's what the Breakthrough Starshot program is working on. And it's quite nice that the Planetary Society are sort of coming to the party on this and... Uh, doing some tests to, to actually check out whether these um, fairly esoteric ideas will work. Um, one thing that we can't uh, announce, you and I, in our conversation now, because uh, the Planetary Society won't tell us what it is for another 10 hours uh, from the time that so we're by the, recording. By the time this podcast is released, this news will be out, so I might get uh, our producer to add it to our Facebook page so that um, people can take a look. I think that's a good idea. But yeah, yeah some, there, is, there is a major announcement that's no, going to accompany this. Exactly, and it, and it is being made by the Planetary Society. They won't tell us what it is, but we'll, we can guess it's something to do with solar sail projects. Uh, it's uh, in 10 hours from you, the time that you and I are speaking. Um, so uh, that's kind of, well, that's where we are. Actually, it's probably, yes, it's 10 hours. That's right. It's uh, 5 p.m. UTC. Okay. So 
Put look on the look on our our um, website or Facebook site. I have to remember to tell him now. <laughs> yeah, you've got to remember to tell him. I will write a note. Uh, but yeah, it is exciting news, and um, you know, if they can find a, um, uh, I suppose a, a comparatively cheap form of functional propulsion, there could be some very good applications for it, especially for unmanned long haul travel. I, I suppose. That's right. It is. It's basically, as you say, it's long haul travel, and uh, you know, and it's probably well. The, the whole idea of breakthrough Starshot is to try and get a probe to Proxima Centauri in something less than a human lifetime. Because if you do it with chemical rockets, your travel time is about sixty thousand years, and most people lose interest on that sort I, I of time. I would get a bit bored. <laughs> I mean, I'd yeah. probably be able to solve a Rubik's Cube by then, and that's, you know, that's about yeah, well, it, without yeah. the book. I, know, well, I could only do it with the book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we uh, we wait with bated breath as to what they're going to announce in regard to uh, the solar sail project, but uh, very exciting news. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and, of course, Professor Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Now, Fred, uh, need to shout out again to our patrons. Our Patreon account is now 28 strong. So thank you to everybody who uh, puts their money where their minds are uh, and supports our little podcast. We really appreciate appreciate it. Uh, you can find us at uh, patreon.com slash space nuts. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook. Uh, we have a presence there, and if you want to follow up on the uh, solar sail story, uh, I, I will most make certain we've got that announcement uh, posted on our Facebook page. And, of course, we're on YouTube, and we're on every known-to-man podcast platform on planet Earth and on Mars. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can find us just about everywhere. Just uh, do a, um, a search for uh, Space Nuts podcast and uh, you'll be in like Flynn, to use the Australian analogy. Do they use that anywhere else in the world, you reckon, Fred? In like Flynn? <laughs> you don't even know what I'm talking about. That's because I was reading up about our next question. All right. Well, let's get straight into those. We've got a few questions because a couple of them I reckon we can bump off quickly. I, I usually like to do that to my colleagues at the radio station, catch them off guard. I quite often at the end of my shift uh, have a chat to the, the fellow that's going on air, Richard, and I, I keep him talking till the news finishes and, and he suddenly realises there's a massive air gap. And yes. I get him at least three times a week. Got him a ripper this morning. It must have been at least three seconds before he hit the button. <laughs> oh, I'm terrible. Uh, let's go to the questions. Yeah, uh, yeah yes, he's such a charmer. That's... <laughs> yeah, well, if you can't make it fun, what's the point? Uh, hi, Andrew and Fred. I was thinking about UFOs and alien visitors and started wondering if, with all the monitoring done in our skies and tracking of space junk and all the man-made satellites in orbit, would it be possible for an alien UFO to be able to enter into our atmosphere without being detected or having its flight path tracked? Hoping you might tackle this question on your show one day. Yeah, we will do it one day, Rick. Thank you. Uh, Rick Grange, um, thank you uh, for the question, Rick. Let's tackle it now, Fred. Um, first of all, assuming that such a thing exists, uh, I would also imagine they'd have stealth technology. You would think so, wouldn't you? Mm. Um, and, of course, stealth technology is all about remaining unseen. Um, I... I, I think that basically the answer to uh, to Rick's question is yes. Would it be possible for an alien UFO to be able to enter our into our atmosphere without being detected or having its flight path tracked? A lot would depend um, on how how stealthy it was, uh, if I can put it that way. Well, let's assume it doesn't have stealth technology, and it's it's like the space doogie that um, passed us by. Um, you know, 18 yeah. months ago or whatever, which so, which was, you know, rather tongue-in-cheek, referred to as a potential alien spacecraft. But, um, yeah, we, we didn't catch that one till very late. That's right. And a, a lot depends on the size. I mean, that thing was uh, 200 metres long, uh, which is quite a large object. It was, uh, if you, you remember, it was the shape of a, a French breadstick. Uh, and... Um, and about other things, 40, forty meters wide. So um, 
and that was yes, that was found, but it wasn't found until after it had passed close to the sun. And it was found by uh, telescopes which are looking for near Earth objects, natural near Earth asteroids. Now, they are pretty good at detecting things, uh, and if if you know, if the illumination was right and the thing wasn't coming at you directly out of the direction of the sun, then yes, that would allow you to to detect a solid object. Uh, and, you know, if you imagine the alien spacecraft was nice and bright and shiny, like many of ours are, in order to reflect the heat of the sun, uh, then it would also reflect the light of the sun and would show up very well in, in visible light and infrared radiation. Um, if if it had, uh, you know, any kind of radio transmission devices on board, that would also alert us to its presence. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sensitivity of our radio receivers uh, is certainly good enough to detect something that was leaking radio radiation that came from another world, Alpha Centauri or somewhere like that. Um, and um, there's also, of course, uh, a lot of defence-related radar tracking. So you wouldn't actually need this thing to be emitting radio signals to be able to track it by radar because it would be picked up by its reflection of uh, signals beamed from Earth or perhaps even from space. So, um, so the answer is yes, it would be possible, I think, to, to, to enter into our atmosphere. But I think it would actually be quite hard. Um, mm. You know, I think we would probably know about it if something like that did turn up. Um, and, and being the kinds of people we are, we'd shoot them down. <laughs> we might as well. We just shoot them down. Yeah, we might. Yeah. You know, we... Um, as they say, um, you can always apologise apologize later. <laughs> um. I think that what saves us is the fact that um, the existence of aliens is fairly... Very unlikely. Fairly long shot, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, so I hope we've answered your question, Rick. Uh, interestingly, my um, new science fiction novel, which is still a work in progress, uh, involves a, a spacecraft which arrives at a planet and is detected by radio waves. How about that? So... Um, <laughs> So you're I'm ahead of the guessing, game. Then. I'm guessing Rick will be the first one to buy it. <laughs> Might have to give him a complimentary copy. <laughs> uh, yeah. We better move on to our next question. Thank you, Rick. Um, hi, Andrew and Fred. Uh, from my basic understanding of the Big Bang Theory, I recall that, in theory, it should have resulted in an equal quantity of matter and antimatter in the universe. The dogma appears to be that now the universe is lacking in antimatter and there is an imbalance between these two types of matter. Our immediate environs in the universe are known to be composed of matter and we have physical evidence that the planets in our system and our sun are not composed of antimatter. However, how do we know that all the visible galaxies in the universe are formed from normal matter and not antimatter? If a galaxy were composed of antimatter, would the light em uh, it emits appear any differently from a normal matter galaxy? Couldn't a hypothetical antimatter galaxy exist a long, uh, as long as it doesn't make contact with another galaxy composed of normal matter and result in an annihilation of the two galactic masses? Alberto Catalano from Sydney. Alberto, hello. I think we've heard from you before. Fascinating question. It's a great question and one that's got, you know... Um, a kind of yes, but answer. Um, <laughs> They're always the best kind. <laughs> as they, yeah, they, as they always do. So um, we can tell when matter and antimatter annihilate because they emit, um, you know, gamma rays with a with a characteristic energy. Uh, so uh, we know that there are clouds of antimatter in our own galaxy, um, but they're 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 being gobbled up by colliding with normal matter. And so you get these gamma rays, uh, so allowing us to detect uh, the, their presence. Um, that's what always happens when antimatter and normal matter get together. Uh, but the question is, well, you know, well placed, because there could be, uh, deep in the universe, there could be antimatter galaxies. That we, we know of no theoretical reason why they shouldn't exist. And theoretically, it would 
behave just like a normal galaxy. Uh, it would, you know, it would have its stars, antimatter stars, and um, all, all, all the rest of it, all the other types of things that are in Except it. Except north would be south, east would be west. <laughs> Actually, um, that wouldn't be right about north and south being swapped because what di- distinguishes matter from antimatter is the electrical charge. Uh, that's it's oppositely charged. Dogs and that's, cats would live together. <laughs> exactly, that's right. So, it's, so, 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 you know, this is the electromagnetic effect, and that might swap round the north and south poles. Never mind all that. Um, the bottom line is. <laughs> That it would be, we think it would be very hard to isolate an antimatter galaxy from normal matter, um, because we know, for example, that between the galaxies there are there are stars, there are intergalactic stars, which are probably stars that have been ejected from the centres of their galaxies uh, by collisions or interaction with a black hole or whatever. Uh, those stars might very well. Uh, drift into your nearest antimatter galaxy and, of course, immediately annihilate with the matter there and produce a signal, um, which might give rise to a background hiss, if you like, in gamma rays um, that will be coming from antimatter galaxies that are having drips of matter falling on them gravitationally. And the bottom line is we don't see that. We do not see any evidence of... Uh, you know, of, of this kind of activity, no matter how far out in the universe we look. We don't see evidence of antimatter and matter colliding. Um, so that suggests that the theory is correct, that yes, maybe the universe was a very nearly equal mix of matter and antimatter when it was formed, but the matter just won out slightly, and there's more matter than antimatter. Um, and that the what the antimatter- VHS beat beta, basically, that's what happened. It- so yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, as as it always is. Yes. <laughs> mm. So so um, yeah, there might be there might be antimatter galaxies, but we don't think there are. That's okay. that's the end of the, the you know that's the end of the the story as far as we know it. Uh-huh. It's not possible. But we don't think they're there. Okay, there you go, Alberto. Great question. Thank you very much. Let's um, file into another one. We'll try and bump off three today. Uh, actually, in the course of um, putting today's questions together, we discovered there were several that we had answered during the course of recent conversations from other people who had similar questions. So, if you haven't heard your name since you know writing to us in April, May, it's because we've already covered it. We, we're pretty confident of that. Uh, hi, Fred and Dave. Mm. <laughs> I think I like I'll stop there. It. I'm going to stop there. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> that's what it says. Uh, I've always found the Voyager mission incredible in that it's still functional after 40 plus years. The distance and speeds covered are incredible. Uh, can you explain what uh, functions are still available and what information uh, we can receive from them, the Voyager probes, I assume you're saying, in the future? and what will be useful. Is there any plan to replicate the mission, and does the New Horizons mission have similar functions available to the Voyager, uh, compared to the Voyager spacecraft? Any information you would have would be awesome. Love the podcasts. Big fan. Adam O'Brien. Thank you, Adam. Dave here. (laughs) Over to Fred. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's actually, you know, I don't know. Dave Dave suits you pretty well, I think, Andrew. My yeah. best mate's named Dave. And I, oh, well, there you go. That's what it is. There can't be two of us. Uh, very special. Can't, you can't have two Daves. <laughs> yeah. When I was Although there Unicorn. was a great uh, duo that put out um, a, a pr- particularly good song some years ago called David and David, Welcome to the Boomtown. Yeah. Just that would saying. Be good. Yeah. Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> to the question. Yes. Um, actually, uh, there is still a lot of functionality in the Voyager spacecraft, both of them. They're not, you know, as as young as they were when they were launched, as, as, uh, as Adam says, 40 plus years ago. Um, but their energy source uh, is still active and some of their instruments are still uh, operational. Um, there is actually just the a coffee maker still works, too. What still works? The coffee maker. 
Um, as far as I know, um, the only amenity that there is on the Voyager spacecraft is a long playing record. Yes, I know. Uh, which I'm does aware not of actually that. make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so you can be entertained, but you can't have a drink of coffee if you're an alien. Um, the, yeah, t the two Voyager spacecraft, both of which took advantage of alignments of the planets uh, to, you know, to um, uh, slingshot the spacecraft to, to, to this grand tour, as it was called, of the outer planets. Fantastic stuff. Uh, and still going strong. Voyager 1, the most distant human-made object in existence, uh, still has, um, you know, the uh, ultraviolet sensors uh, and some of the other sensors still fully operational. Um, I think they don't have any facility now to rotate the spacecraft to measure the magnetic field in different directions. I think they've got to take whatever measurements they get uh, and that leads us to believe that these two spacecraft have now crossed the, 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 the heliopause, which is the boundary of the sun's magnetic field. Mm. Um, but it's incredible that they're still working. And the estimate is that the, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, electrical power and the propellant uh, that you need to actually just shift the, the spacecraft around uh, to, to op, op, um, maintain its attitude properly, uh, that will last until around 2025. Uh, once 2025 goes by, the RTG, the radioisotope thermal generator, which is a little container of plutonium, uh, and that provides heat, which provides electrical power, that will have faded to the extent that any further science instrument operations will have to cease. Uh, and so there won't be any data coming back. But that's still astonishing, really, 2025 for oh, a spacecraft that were launched back in the 70s, 50 so years later. We've still got six years of data to collect. We're still learning. Yeah, we, we are still learning indeed. Mm. So uh, the, the other questions, uh, is, there, is there a similar mission planned? Not really, because we haven't got the alignment of those outer planets. Yeah, because uh, Voyage, the Voyager probe concept was actually a, a sort of a back office after plan. It wasn't even something that was slated as an upfront mission. It was just uh, one bloke, I think, who came up and he went, oh, hang on, this might yeah. work. And yeah, <laughs> ultimately exactly. it got, it got uh, commissioned. And they did it twice, that's right. Yeah. So it was the, using the planets to, to, to take this and I apologise for not knowing his name because it was brilliant. What he achieved yeah, brilliant. was magnificent. T taking advantage of a, a fairly rare alignment of the outer planets. You know, remember... Yeah, it was Neptune just a, was played now. a case of timing, wasn't it? Just good timing. Oh. Yeah, ne I can't remember what Neptune's year is. It's, well, I mean, Pluto is uh, 248 years, so and Neptune's... Uh, actually, in a, a as we said earlier, a resonant orbit with Pluto, so it's it's uh, of the order of 100 and, 180 years or something like that. So um, yes, there there aren't any plans to replicate that. Um, the New Horizons spacecraft, of course, has, does have similar functions. That was one of Adam's other questions. Has it got similar functions on board? It, um, it has something like I think it's got six major instruments on board, all of which, as far as I know, are still working including a dust counter and, um, you know, all the, all the telemetric and magneto, uh, uh, magneto-sensitive instruments, as well as the cameras and the spectrographs. Uh, New Horizons is in very good health and uh, will probably last 50 years as well. Wow. Uh, who knows? Is it going a different way? It is, yeah. It's going in a different direction. All, all five of the spacecraft leaving the solar system are going in different directions. The two Voyagers, two Pioneers and New Horizons. Fantastic. And all of them will almost certainly outlast our species, which yeah. is a very interesting thought. It's not a nice thought, but <laughs> we're yeah. talking billions of years. That's OK. Yeah, we are. Billions of years. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thanks for the question, Adam. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, still a lot to learn from the Voyagers and New Horizon and everything that's out there. Um, maybe we could start sending our junk that way as well and not have to worry about it anymore. Uh, Fred, thank you as always. It's been uh, fantastic, great fun, and we'll talk to you next week.
I've enjoyed every minute of it, Dave, and I look forward to talking to you next week as Thank well. You. Thank you, Fred. You can leave. Uh, Fred Watson, astronomer at large. And from me, Andrew Duckley, thanks for um, joining us again. Don't forget to send us your cards and letters, and uh, we look forward to your company next time on another edition of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.